Our second scripture lesson today comes from Mark chapter 16. Listen again for God's word. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that that stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be afraid. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. I stand before you today excited to share some news with you. No, it's not that we finally have a refrigerator in our kitchen, which has been under construction since December. It's about my work on the Presbyterian Mission Agency Board. My work on the board that oversees the work of our national church has opened up an opportunity for me. I will be traveling to Washington, D.C. this summer to be part of a panel discussion with members of the White House. Yes, the White House on religion in public life. Can you believe it? Well, you shouldn't. <laughs> April Fools. So I couldn't resist the opportunity that today gives us. It's April Fool's Day and it's Easter Sunday. How often does that happen? Well, not that often, it turns out. Since 1700, 318 years ago, Easter has only fallen on April 1st 11 times. The last time Christians celebrate Easter on April 1st was in 1956. After today, Easter doesn't fall on April Fool's Day again until 2029 and then 2040. And after that, we'll have to wait until 2108 and then 2170. So unless you can live that long, enjoy the day while you can. It doesn't happen very often that we get the opportunity to discuss the greatest prank in human history on the day of pranks, or to ponder who the April Fool is on Easter Day. The best explanation I've heard about why we even have April Fool's Day has to do with this time of year when we begin to emerge from our homes for the first time after a long winter. We are like mole people leaving the subterranean burrows to frolic in the sunshine for a while, one author wrote. I think we understand that. How many more snowstorms and power outages and canceled school days are we going to have? It's time for spring to break in and winter's effects to melt away into some fun and sun, laughter and play. So we'd better watch out today on this, after this long winter. The internet has been full of clever pranks to play on Easter. What's inside that foil wrapped egg this year? Chocolate or a grape? Is that sponge cake really made out edible, or is it actually made out of sponges? Were those eggs hard boiled before you dyed them? And be careful, your Easter basket, when you find it, may be full of cleaning supplies this year. <laughs> the BBC once broadcast a short documentary in a current affairs series purporting to show Swiss farmers picking freshly grown spaghetti in what they called the Swiss Spaghetti Harvest. The BBC was later flooded with requests to purchase a spaghetti plant, <laughs> forcing them to declare the film a hoax on the news the next day. We play the fool so often, but hopefully, hopefully we know how to laugh about it because at their best, Foolish jokes surprise us out of our normal assumptions. 
They wake us up and make us pay attention. And hopefully they give us all an opportunity to not take ourselves so seriously and maybe laugh a little. That's what makes our reading in the Gospel of Mark so perfect for today. It it surprises us like biting into a chocolate bunny full of mustard. Take a moment. (laughs) Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Solome couldn't wait for the Sabbath to be over in our scripture passage today. They had to get to the tomb and, and care for the body of their dead leader. His body had been tortured crucified and hastily placed in a tomb. There had been no dignity for him in death or his burial. And the people who loved him couldn't let that be the last thing done for him. And, that w- and they would not let that be the last way he would be remembered. Love acts differently. Love cares. So they set off for, this to- for his tomb the moment the first ray of the sun peeked over the horizon. They knew what to expect at the tomb. A hastily wrapped body, quickly placed in the tomb. They probably even expected to to be hit with the smell of decay as well. The scene would not have been new to them, especially if they had cared for other bodies after death. But that's what love is, and that's what love does. We care for our loved ones in death as we did in life. Love stays with us to say goodbye. That's the love those three women embodied. Love does not abandon us, they might say. When they reached the tomb that day, there was one major obstacle in the way of them fulfilling their commitment to love Jesus in life and in death, a big stone. Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb, they asked each other as they walked along. That's when the surprises began. They arrived to find it already moved aside. Then they entered the tomb and found a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting where Jesus' body had been laid. They weren't just surprised. Alarm is more accurate. You don't often find someone sitting where your loved one was buried, let alone find the grave opened. Hopefully never, actually. The young man didn't explain who he was, but he knew how frightened and upset they were. Unfortunately, his words didn't do much to calm their surprise, but only added to it. He told them something that, they didn't, that you don't expect to hear at tombs. Jesus has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Could there be any greater surprise on that day? Jesus wasn't in the tomb, and now they were supposed to go and tell his disciples that news, and that Jesus was going to meet them soon. Was this a joke? A prank? The the women didn't stick around to find out. They were so surprised that they fled the tomb. They were seized with terror and amazement at what they had found. And who can blame them? Death is supposed to be the end. But that's not what they found that first Easter morning. Grief is supposed to be the final response to death. But that's not how they were invited to respond. It's foolish to believe things are any different. It doesn't make sense. You can't verify it. And you certainly don't know if someone is playing a cruel joke on you or not. Maybe that's why Mark ends the story with one last surprise. The women left the tomb that day, fled from there, and said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Who ends a story, especially a story of faith, with the word afraid? Is this all a big joke? Maybe. In his article entitled, When Easter Falls on April Fool's Day, Presbyterian elder Miles Towns wrote, It is neither a stretch nor a slight to say that the resurrection was a joke and a good one. What more could Jesus have done to mock the world that killed him 
then rise from the dead. Or as Pastor Emily Heath writes, in a way the resurrection might sound like the ultimate April Fool's Day joke. The world thought Jesus was dead, and yet he sprang from the grave. You can almost hear him say, just kidding, y'all. If the crucifixion shows us God's sacrificial love, then the resurrection shows us just how surprising God's love can be. Our human understanding of love and relationships, our human wisdom would say that death ends life and love. But not God's love, not God's wisdom. In God's crazy, upside-down world, love raises us to new life. That's what the Apostle Paul was trying to tell the Corinthians and us. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are. Resurrection is God's greatest prank on the ways of this world, the ultimate act of surprising love, the greatest April Fool's Day joke on death itself. When have you been surprised by love? When has the new life of God's love surprised you? That's what God's love does. It welcomes home both the obedient child and the prodigal. It loves the prostitute as much as the pious, the poor as much as those who have everything. God's love stands with victims of violence and poverty over those who make laws that secure the rights of a few. In fact, if it sounds foolish, like living generously, or being patient and kind or forgiving, offering healing, or being fearless, or serving other people, or sacrificing something, then what you're experiencing is probably God pranking the world with love. If it surprises people with new life, if it seems like a foolish way to offer people human dignity, then it's probably the love of God. All of this reminds me of that romantic comedy, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. The main character, Tula Portokalos, is very Greek, from a very Greek family who runs a Greek restaurant in town. Tension erupts when Tula falls in love with a man named Ian Miller, who is as un-Greek as you can get, and the opposite of whom her parents hoped she would marry. When she introduces her parents to Ian, her father is at first dismayed and then angry, because Ian has not one ounce of Greek in him, but is rather a Zeno, an outsider, a foreigner. Tula's father, Gus, tells her to end it. But Tula loves Ian and says yes when he proposes, and the rest of the movie portrays this hilarious time of how Tula's Greek Orthodox and, and Ian's waspy worlds and families at first collide and then converge as they commit to love one, to the love that they feel for one another. A poignant moment at the end of the movie comes during that over-the-top wedding reception complete with Greco-Roman columns and fountains flowing with ouzo. As the host, Tula's father, Gus, stands up to give a speech which welcomes not only the wedding guests but also this incongruous new son-in-law and his pallid parents into the family. As is customary at a Greek wedding, Gus gives Tula and Ian an envelope which we assume will be money. When they open the envelope, however, Tula and Ian are shocked to discover that they, that envelope contains the deed to a new house. This extravagant gift tells Tula that no matter whom she loves, she will always have a home in her family and that Ian is welcomed there too. Of course, in the closing scene, we find out the house is located right next to her parents. <laughs> but maybe we can take from that 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 love for that family will always be there to embrace her. Friends, this Easter, the joke's on us. The tomb is empty. 
Christ refuses to dwell in sin and death or in any of the other lifeless tombs we create in our lives and world, be they poverty and oppression, addiction and despair, fear and violence. Jesus' final resting place is not the grave, but at the side of God in heaven. In raising Jesus Christ from the dead, God has bought us all a new home, eternally at God's side. This is not just a future resting place, but it is our home here and now, today and every day. This may sound like foolishness to our ears and to the rest of the world, but to all who open their ears and their lives to this good news, it is the truth of God's surprising love. A love so deep and strong, a love so faithful and fearless, a love so patient, kind, and generous that God would send His only Son to live and die for us, that we all might emerge from our tombs of sin and death like prisoners newly freed from our dark cells, like hibernating creatures emerging from our dark dens, basking in the warmth, bright light of a new day, breathing deeply the fresh air of new life, ready to run and laugh and maybe even play some pranks on each other. Easter is the best April Fool's Day ever. Jesus is not dead. He's not here. He's risen. Go and tell the world that God, that, about God's surprising love and the new life that it brings to all. Go into your lives and He will meet you there because He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.